That was funny. <clears throat> On February 4th, 2013, Jan Luck, assistant controller for the Lakeside Company, <laughs> delivered to the Abernethy and Chapman auditors an analysis of all vendor invoices received by the company. During December and January, a total of 283 invoices had been located by Look with assistance from the independent auditors. These bills represented a variety of charges <laughs> incurred by each of the company's stores, including rent, heating, oil, electricity, insurance, water, maintenance fees, property taxes, and advertising. In addition, a number of the invoices reflected the travel and lodging expenses of the members of Lakeside's sales staff. For, for each of these invoices, Luck had scheduled the total amount owed by Lakeside The expense or asset account to be charged, the due date and the period and the date paid or the date on which payment would be made. Look also calculated and listed the portion of each bill that was legally owed by Lakes as of December 31st, 2012. Based on this analysis, accrued expenses totaling 46,311 were to be recorded by the company as a Year end adjusting entry. Carol Mitchell, senior auditor with the Abernethy and Chapman organization, was aware that she would have to verify the accuracy of the 46,311 accrual. As with all client prepared computations, the auditing firm had a responsibility to establish the validity of this liability. In this instance, though, the need to review the analysis was especially important since a large change was being made in the net income figure reported by the client. Mitchell was primarily interested in Luck's ability to allocate these expenses correctly between 2012 and 2013. In arriving at the 46,311 accrual, every invoice had been examined by luck order to assign the appropriate amount to each period. Because of the potential audit time involved, Mitchell wanted to avoid having to assign a member of her staff to review and check all 283 documents. Instead, she hoped to validate the client's work by analyzing a representative sample of these invoices. Mitchell knows that there are two major types of sampling methods. Sampling for attributes and sampling for variables. With sampling for attributes, the auditor is concerned with the rate of occurrence of a particular characteristic, such as the error rate in connection with the application of a control procedure being in place or not. With sampling for variables, the auditor is concerned with estimating a balance such as the appropriate dollar value of an account or a transaction. 
Since Mitchell was concerned with the occurrence of errors in the allocation process, she decided to apply sampling for attributes. Based on Mitchell's previous work with sampling for attributes on other audit clients, she realized that she had to establish three parameters corresponding to her judgment of the client and the importance of the procedure being evaluated. Acceptable risk of assessing the control risk too low. Estimated population exception rate. Tolerable exception rate. Acceptable risk of assessing control risk too low. Because of the decision to sample, Mitchell understood the degree of risk was involved since all of the invoices were not to be reviewed. A possibility existed that the auditing firm would evaluate Luck's work as being reliable, but in fact it was not. After some consideration, Mitchell chose a 10% acceptable risk of assessing control risk too low for this test. She was willing to accept the statistical fact that one time in 10, the sample would mislead her into relying on work that was not actually acceptable. Estimated population exception rate. Based on the degree of complexity involved in the allocation process, Mitchell realized that Luck would probably commit some errors. Perfection was not anticipated for this type of task. In a statistical sampling plan designed to determine the frequency of an attribute, the auditor must estimate an actual occurrence rate. From discussions with Luck as well as observations of her work, Mitchell believed that a 3% exception rate should be considered normal. Tolerable exception rate Finally, Mitchell had to address the possibility that the errors existing in the population were of a quantity significant enough to nullify reliance on Luck's work. Mitchell decided that if a sample indicated the presence of an error rate in excess of 6%, she would be forced to devise alternative procedures to verify. <laughs> Mitchell's next concern was the determination of the number of invoices that had to be selected to furnish the desired level of assurance. Because of the frequent use of sampling for attributes, the CPA firm of Abernethy and Chapman provides its auditors with statistical tables to assist them in the implementation of this testing procedure. Based on predetermined mathematical calculations, the proper size for any sample can be found on these tables. The specific table to be used is determined by the auditor's decision 
concerning the ARACR exhibit presents the table for a 10% ARACR. The level chosen by Mitchell for this test, the appropriate sample size is a function of the E per and the chosen TER. Top row after Mitchell selects the sample and analyses and analyzes individual items. Conclusions about the population as a whole will be derived by using a second table. Exhibit presents mathematical results based on the auditor's presents mathematical results based on the auditor's desire to limit <sighs> ARACR to 10%. The sample size left column and the actual number of exceptions discovered in the sample top row provide the computed upper exception rate Anticipating the population, however, this upper exception rate is not intended as a precise indication of the percentage of mistakes that are present. Rather, Mitchell can assume, given the pre parameters that she has said that the exception rate in the 303 allegations is no higher than the percentage indicated in Exhibit 10-2. Consequently, if the computed upper exception rate is equal to or less than the 6% tolerable exception rate established as a prerequisite. The number of errors in Lux work will be judged as acceptable. Mitchell will still have to analyze the individual errors found in the sample since both the type as well as quality of mistakes must be evaluated prior to the start of this testing. Mitchell makes one final calculation. The table produced in Exhibit 10-1 is based on a large population and a sampling plan with replacement where items chosen will be recorded and then returned to the population. Lakeside has only 283 invoices and the artists will not replace selected items to avoid having them chosen a second time. Mitchell is aware that a finite correction factor can be applied to adjust the information found in this table so that it corresponds with the client's population. In some cases, the adjustment significantly reduces the required number of items to be tested, thus increasing audit efficiency. The formula applied for this purpose is appropriate sample size equals n apostrophe divided by 1 plus n. That was it. That was it. <laughs> what the? State the objectives of the audit testing, define the attributed attributes to be estimated, define the population, define the sampling unit, specify the acceptable risk of assessing control risk too low, and discuss any factors affecting this decision, estimate the exception rate of the population, and discuss any factors. <laughs>
affecting this estimation, specify the tolerable exception rate and discuss any factors affecting this estimation, specify the toler indicate the sample size and show the use of the finite correction factor if applicable, indicate the method to used to draw a random sample. Indicate the number of exceptions discovered, the rate of exceptions in the sample, and the computed upper exception rate in this population from a quantitative perspective. Is the population reliable? Describe the types of exceptions that were found. Recommendations. Wow, we are on principle number one. Whoa. Thanks for fixing Notepad, finally. I am on page. I read some of this stuff already. Okay, so we're on page 28. Principle one. <clears throat> Demonstrate commitment to integrity and ethical values. The oversight body and management should demonstrate a commitment to integrity The oversight body and management should demonstrate a commitment to integrity and ethical values. The following attributes contribute to the design, implementation, and operating effectiveness of this principle. Tone at the top, standards of conduct, adherence to standards of conduct. Tone at the top. The oversight body and management demonstrate the importance of integrity and ethical values through their directives, 
attitudes, and behavior. The oversight body management lead by an example that demonstrates the organization's values, philosophy, and operating style. The oversight body and management set the tone at the top and and throughout the organization by their example, which is which is fundamental to an effective internal control system in large entities. The various layers of management in the organizational structure may also set the tone in the middle. The oversight bodies and management's directives, attitudes, and behaviors reflect the integrity and ethical values expected throughout the entity. The oversight body and management reinforce the commitment to doing what is right, not just maintaining a minimum level of performance necessary to comply with applicable laws and regulations so that these priorities are understood by all stakeholders such as regulators, employees, and the general public. Tone at the top can be either a driver as shown in the preceding paragraphs, or a barrier to internal control. Without a strong tone at the top to support an internal control system, the entity's risk identification may be incomplete, risk responses may be inappropriate, control activities may not be appropriately designed or implemented, information and communication may falter. and results of monitoring may not be understood or acted upon to remediate deficiencies. Standards of conduct. Management establishes standards of conduct management establishes standards of conduct to communicate expectations concerning integrity and ethical values the entity uses ethical values to balance the needs and concerns of different stakeholders such as regulators employees and the general public the standards of conduct guide the directors, attitudes, and behaviors of the organization in achieving the entity's objectives, management with oversight from the oversight body defines the organization's expectations of ethical values and the standards of conduct. Management may consider using policies, operating principles, or guidelines to communicate the standards of conduct to the organization. Adherence. To, the, to standards of conduct. Management establishes processes to evaluate performance against the entity's expected standards of conduct and address any deviations in a timely manner. Management uses established standards of conduct as the basis for evaluating adherence to integrity and ethical values across the organization. Management evaluates the adherence
your standards of conduct across all levels of the entity to gain assurance that the entity standards of conduct are implemented effectively. Management evaluates the directives, attitudes, and behaviors of individuals and teams. Evaluations may consist of ongoing monitoring or separate evaluations. Individual personnel can also report issues through reporting lines such as regular staff meetings, upward feedback processes, a whistleblowing program, or an ethics hotline. The oversight body evaluates management's adherence to the standards of conduct as well as the overall adherence by the entity. Management determines the tolerance level for deviations. Management may determine that the entity will have zero tolerance for deviations from ex certain expected standards of conduct, while deviations from others may be addressed with warnings to personnel. Management establishes a process for evaluations of individual and team adherence to standards of conduct that escalates and and remediates deviations. Management addresses deviations Management addresses deviations from expected standards of conduct Management addresses deviations from expected standards of conduct timely and consistently. Depending on the severity of the deviation determined through the evaluation process, management with oversight from the oversight body takes appropriate actions and may also need to consider applicable laws and regulations. The standards of conduct to which management holds personnel, uh, however, remain consistent. And I finally finished principle one. It's only 16 more to read. And only... 38 more pages to read somehow. How is this going to take up 38 pages? Man. Principle 2. Exercise. That's like an average of two pages per principle. Seriously? Principle 2. Exercise oversight responsibility. The oversight body should oversee the entity's internal control system. The attributes are oversight structure, oversight for the internal control system, input for remediation of deficiencies. <laughs> That was a funny thing you saw in my search autofill thing. Whoa, I got an email. Let's see how useless it is. Oh, very, very useless. Oversight structure. Okay, some of these things are like bars don't really have oversight body because it's just like the owner of I don't know the there's not a board of directors for the bar. It's just the owner of the bar and like or the manager of the bar. That's pretty much it. Like, how do you expect us to address this principle for bars? 
which are such tiny little businesses that have like three employees, right? Isn't that what a bar is? They have, I mean, some bars just have one person running the whole thing, don't they? Well, not exactly. I don't think any bar can just have one person running the whole thing because there's lots of different things that go on in a bar. Well, that was, because like, how many bar do most bars just sell drinks and that's it? Or do they also sell food? And making food and buying the drinks and preparing the drinks and and everything can't all be done by one person, can it? So, that's funny. Um, oversight structure, the entity determines an oversight structure to fulfill responsibilities set forth by applicable laws and regulations, relevant government guidance and feedback from key stakeholders the entity will select or if mandated by law will have selected for it an oversight body when the oversight body is composed of an entity management, well that's an bar. The activities referenced in the Green Book as performed by management exclude these members of management. Wait, no. When in their roles as the oversight body. Responsibilities of an oversight body when the oversight structure of an entity is led by senior management. Senior management may distinguish itself from divisional or functional management through the establishment of an oversight body. An oversight body oversees the entity's operations, provides constructive criticism to management, and where appropriate makes oversight decisions so that the entity achieves its objectives in alignment with the entity's integrity and ethical values. Qualifications for an oversight body. In selecting members for an oversight body, the entity or applicable body defines the entity knowledge, relevant expertise, number of members, and possible independence needed to fulfill the oversight responsibilities for the entity. Members of an oversight body understand the entity's objectives, its related risks and expectations of its stakeholders in addition to an oversight body. An organization within the federal government may have several bodies that are key stakeholders for the entity, such as the White House, Congress, the Office of Management and Budget, and the Department of the Treasury. Also, this is the federal government book, so that's why it's mentioning all those. <laughs> An oversight body works with an oversight body works with key stakeholders to understand their expectations and help the entity fulfill these expectations if appropriate. The entity or applicable body also considers the expertise needed by members to oversee question and evaluate management. Capabilities expected of all members of an oversight body include integrity and ethical values, leadership, critical thinking, and problem-solving abilities. Further, in determining the number of members of an oversight body, the entity or applicable body considers the need for members of the oversight body to have specialized skills to enable discussion, offer constructive criticism to management, and make appropriate oversight decisions. 
Some specialized skills may include the following internal control mindset, e.g. professional skepticism and perspectives on approaches for identifying and responding to risks and assessing the effectiveness of the system of internal control, programmatic expertise, including knowledge of the entity's mission, programs, and operational processes, e.g. procurement, human capital, and functional management expertise, financial expertise, including financial reporting, e.g. accounting standards and financial reporting requirements and budgetary expertise, relevant systems and technology, e.g. understanding critical systems and technology, risks and opportunities, legal and regulatory expertise, e.g. understanding of applicable laws and regulations. If authorized by applicable laws and regulations, the entity may also consider including independent members as part of an oversight body. Members of an oversight body scrutinize and question management's activities present alternative views and fact and act when faced with obvious or suspected wrongdoing independent members with relevant expertise provide value through their impartial evaluation of the entity and its operations and achieving objectives oversight for the internal control system the oversight body oversees management's design implementation and operation of the entity's internal control system. The oversight by responsibilities for the entity's internal control system include the following control environment risk assessment control activities infor information and communication monitoring Ooh. control environment establish integrity and ethical values and establish oversight structure develop expectations of competence and maintain accountability to all members of the oversight body and key stakeholders risk assessment oversee management's assessment of risk to the achievement of objectives including the potential impact of significant changes fraud and management override of internal control control activities provide oversight to management in the development and performance of control activities information and communication analyze and discuss information relating to the entity's achievement of objectives monitoring scrutinize the nature and scope of management's monitoring activities <laughs> monitors and monitoring as well as management's evaluation and remediation of identified deficiencies these responsibilities are supported by the organizational structure that the management establishes the oversight body oversees management's design implementation and operation of the entity's organizational structure so that the processes necessary to enable the oversight body to fulfill its responsibilities exist and are operating effectively input for remediation of deficiencies the oversight body provides input uh, to management's plans for remediation of deficiencies in the internal control system as appropriate management reports deficiencies identified
management reports deficiencies identified in the internal control system to the oversight body. The oversight body oversees and provides direction to management on the remediation of these deficiencies. The oversight body also provides direction when a deficiency crosses organization or boundaries or units or when the interests of management may conflict with remediation efforts when appropriate and authorized. The oversight body may direct the creation of teams to address or oversee specific matters critical to achieving the company's objectives. The oversight body is responsible for overseeing the remediation of deficiencies as appropriate and for providing direction to management on appropriate time frames for correcting these deficiencies. Principle three, establish structure, responsibility, and authority. Management should establish an organizational structure, assign responsibility, and delegate authority to achieve the entity's objectives. Organizational structure, assignment of responsibility, and delegation of authority Documentation of the internal control system. Dude, I just realized these paragraphs are messed up. There's two, it goes back to one. Like it starts at one, two, three, four, and then it, because section one, okay, OV 1.01, that's the difference. Okay. We are on 3.02. We are on page 33. Section 3.02. That's where we're at. Oh, that's funny. Management should establish an organizational structure. Assign responsibility and delegate authority to achieve the entity's objectives. Well, we finished reading two principles. Only 15 more to go. Woo!